Daybreak at Trevor on Bijet Citizen TV. Can you use the hashtag Daybreak? That's what we're picking up right now. Let's take up the first one, see what you're saying, and pose the questions to my guests. Injina Nazaro says some graft cases are taking too long to be concluded. Corruption fighting back, and some corrupt officials are being treated with kids' gloves simply because of their position in the society. Why are some counties untouchable? Twale. Are there counties that are untouchable and are there people uh, we are treating with kids' gloves? Uh, th thank you. That, that question is good. And uh, it shows you the frustration on the ground. That's why this gentleman is, is, is a, is a, is a man. Eh? Yes, Lady Lazaro. Yes. Yeah, th that gentleman, uh, the way I read the question, I can see the frustration that the general public has. We need to understand that the DPP has said here yeah, that yeah. Uh, a corruption case must be watertight. So corruption cases, when you say some counties are untouchable, I would like to tell the, the, viewer. the, the viewer that I disagree with him because when Trevor asked me about how is the situation, I said all counties have got issues and all of them, we are investigating them. Out of the 47 counties, we have charged nine governors. Out of the 47 counties, there is no single county that has got no case that is not under investigation by the ESCC. The reason why cases take too long, corruption cases too long, like the, set, the nine cases that uh, the governors are facing, these governors, we charged them long ago. Even me as a CEO, I've forgotten. If you ask me which are these governors, I'll have to think deeply tell you so and so, so and so, because the cases are in court. We don't know when they're going to be concluded. And each, in the fight against corruption or the, 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 the investigation on a corruption case, there are segment for every institution. The ESEC will investigate. After investigation, we take to the DPP. We are not guaranteed that the DPP will charge. He may bring back the case, say, look, there are some gaps, or what you call cover points. Can you go and check A, B, C, D? Sometimes, some of these cases, they involve a foreign jurisdiction. You need an MLA, mutual legal assistance. Because without that, any evidence from abroad in court does not count. When you take back the case, the DPP himself just like ESEC and the judiciary, they are equally overstretched. The capacity in terms of your workforce has been a very big challenge to ESEC, yeah. to, the, uh, to the DPP, and to the judiciary. When these cases are taken to the judiciary by the DPP, it's a long process. They are also overstretched, and there are quite a number of frustrations that can come out in the process. When you ask me about the challenges of uh, the ESCC is facing, one of the biggest challenges we face, yeah. and even the DPP is facing, is witnesses being compromised. You have a very key witness in a case that is involving millions of shillings. And the accused silently, there will be no evidence. The accused silently will oil that person. This is a poor Kenyan, and he can be given something small, and he's just told. And the law is very clear. You cannot compel somebody to become a witness. What do you do? We've had cases. We, we, uh, the DPP will tell you he has withdrawn corruption cases as a result of witnesses disappearing. Then there's the issue of uh, the backlog. I'll give you a good example. If you look at the serious fraud office in the UK, I've been there. Uh, the DPP, I think, has been there also. Yeah. If you look at the serious fraud office in, U, uh, in, in UK, per, per year they are dealing with about 15 cases, major cases. When it comes to the laws in Kenya, the law in Kenya on corruption is that any corrupt activity, when reported to the ESCC, must be investigated, must. In a year where we have 365 days, minus the Saturday and Sunday, minus, you know, in a day, we only work for one third of the day. That is eight out of 24 hours. Yeah. So in a, in a year, you have that, that period. 
you find that uh, 5,300 cases you get in a, in a year as ESCC. You have roughly about 170 investigators. And we have a policy. Every case must not have less than two investigators. Because we are safeguarding the investigator from being accused of taking bribe. Yeah. And we are safeguarding the complainant that his case is handled properly because you have investigators, two who can do a synergy of looking at the case. So backlog is a very big problem. If you look at, let's say like, uh, I'll give an example of our Mombasa office. The ESCC, we have 11 regional offices. In coast, we have Malindi and Mombasa. Upper coast and the lower coast. If you look at Mombasa, we have about five investigators in the office. They are dealing with three counties. These counties have got issues with embezzlement, employing people uh, through backdoor, through not proper procedure, the, 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 the boards yeah. that employs. You have issues to deal with uh, MCAs taking interest and disappearing, fictitious visits. Now, it comes back to what I was telling you, yeah. that uh, some of those problems could have been cured if the citizen had, had elected good people. So all that makes corruption cases to move slowly. From ESEC, they move very slowly. And I actually argued when I was being vetted yeah. to take this position that there is need to amend the law to have a threshold of which cases the ESEC can handle. But today, we are in a very tight corner. Yeah. If somebody complains that he gave a chief 300 bob to get a birth certificate, that guy can write to us, say, I made a complaint. I want to see how far this thing has gone. So the report is done in Malindi that a chief in Lamu took 500 bob. I have to send two officers to Lamu to investigate a case of 500 shillings, pay those officers per DM for three days, get my Land Rover to Lamu, come back to prepare that case, taking the witness to Malindi, so when we do the economy of scale, because one of the biggest problems that even the DPP will tell you he has yeah. is budgetary constraint. Yeah. The money we have given is not enough. So to answer uh, the viewer, there are multiple issues yeah. that make us to move very slowly in a, in a, in a corruption case. Okay. For the high level corruption case, where the viewer is talking of untouchable, that is where I believe he's looking at, yeah. when you charge somebody what you call a big fish, that guy does not come with one lawyer. He will come with six refined lawyers in that case. And everything you do, you must do it very systematic. And at that time, ESCC does not own the calendar of activities. Even the DPP does not own the calendar of activity. It's the court registrar yeah. that will tell you this case is coming to hearing on this date. Mm. So all those things make the entire way of handling corruption cases yeah. very slow. Yeah. And we have said that strategically at national level, if we want to address corruption, we have to look at the three, three main pillars. Yeah. The society, we are talking of the political environment. Yeah. The political environment must also be very clean. If you have MPs, governors who have found their way because they bribed mm -hmm. uh, citizens, definitely when they occupy those offices, the first mission they want they have is to recoup what they spent. Yeah. The second the mission, if they are clever as a strategic, in a negative way, not positive way, they'll start accumulating for the next campaign. Now, here's the problem. So we have to have a clean political culture. Yeah. And we need to have a society that is equally clean, that it looks at you. Are you somebody that we can trust giving you this seat? Yeah. Then we have now the institutions where we usually take the blame, the judiciary, the ESCC yeah. and ODPP. The institutions must be strengthened. We must be given enough money to operate. We must get the cooperation from the public. Yeah. When I pick witnesses, and I, I tell the DPP these are the witnesses, I am assured that they will not take off for the case to collapse. Okay. Yeah. And DPP, is that the biggest challenge when witnesses withdraw? But also, you're the chair of a multi-sectoral committee that puts ESCC, DPP, Judiciary, and DCI together. What is the strategy going forward to ensure there's a seamless flow of events? 
<coughs> well, I think the issue of witness is one of the many challenges that, that we have. Um, and and uh, we've been trying to deal with it in, in different ways. Um, sometimes in court you can turn the witness to a hostile witness and compel them uh, to give the evidence. But in the situation where the <coughs> Barak is saying that the witness disappears and we cannot trust them, then it has an impact on, on, on the case. Uh, but what we've also been doing as a strategy, we've been accused over time uh, of uh, um, <clears throat> charging too many people. Yeah. But we, are, we, are, we, are, we find ourselves in that position yeah. because the, the Kenyans don't want to be witnesses. You know, um, so they look at it in a very uh, myopic you know, way. They don't look, at, they don't look as, at corruption as something that is having a negative effect on the whole of society. Yeah. So we are compelled to charge many people, and then now start negotiating some of them. And that's why in court you will see we have turned so and so to a witness, because it has come to their real realization that uh, you know I've been charged, I might be convicted. I would rather help in in, in giving the evidence that that is required. Um, so we, you have to go and do a lot of other things. Yeah. We we for example when we started we came up with. Uh, um, um, arrests and uh, we um, used to give statements. Um, this was uh, fought very vehemently. Yeah. When you charge somebody, a governor, then you are accused of uh, leaning against a certain political uh, uh, persuasion that that person holds. Yeah. That suddenly you are targeting a certain community or a certain political party or a certain individual. Uh, and, and then Kenyans agree to that. Uh, you know, some of us were, were being accused of persecuting people and not prosecuting them. Yeah. Uh, and this is what uh, Barak is saying. Uh, and, and, and on that point, when, when Kenyans go and elect a corrupt official, remember that is the same person who is going to legislate in, in parliament. Yeah. And is most likely going to legislate against um, some of the things that we are doing. Uh, so they will either um, <clears throat> go out there and start fiddling and, and meddling with the powers of uh, uh, ODPP or ESCC, make it weak, mm. uh, uh, or they will go and make some, some legislation. Some people had even attempted to give themselves immunity uh, two years ago. So <clears throat> these are some of the things that uh, we, we really have to think, to think about. Yeah. On the issue of uh, um, craft ca cases taking long, yeah. um, of course, I've, uh, we've explained that, that uh, um, um, we are trying our best. Yeah. But constitutionally, and I repeat this again, that even the accused has a right, and that right is protected and enshrined in the Constitution. Yeah. And some of those things that they do uh, make it look like you know, it's taking very long. We have tried. Most of the cases that we brought in 2018, we have tried to ensure that we, we, we conclude them within two to three years. Yeah. And we have some you know, cases that we've succeeded, like the Waluke case, we managed to do it uh, within two years. And these are test cases that we, we brought along. There's the Wario case that we also managed to conclude within two years. And there are others that, that are there. And, and there are others that will come. Yeah. Um, so we are, we are improving. Uh, and, 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 and we are hoping that Kenyans are, are able to see that improvement. Another thing that Kenya has done yeah. that the, the rest of the region has not done is, for example, we have Witness Protection Agency Authority. And it's doing a great job. Uh, but we are asking Treasury, because we've seen the benefit of it, to support them more so that they are able now to cover more uh, um, with the witnesses who will need to be protected. Yeah to assure them that, you know, one, they can give evidence without any threats, but also to, to, to um, <coughs> um, uh, insulate them from uh, some of the, of the actions that, uh, you know, uh, cartels are, are involved in. So okay. we are trying our best. Right. And, and, and I think, um, for, for example, um, ESCC uh, is, is, is in Zaire, in Congo, sorry. Yeah helping the Congo government set up its own 
uh, anti-corruption authority. And they came and asked for that. Uh, the other day we had Tanzanian prosecutors coming to Kenya to look at the decision to charge and, and look at how we, uh, we work on in terms of um, mutual legal assistance and other things. Yeah. So regionally, Kenya is doing very well and even globally because there are certain things as Kenyans we have done that people in, 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 in cert certain jurisdictions that are considered uh, uh, um, advanced have not done. Janity, from the UN ODC perspective, what kind of support are you looking to offer to the institutions going forward? So part of the mandate that uh, we have been given uh, under the family of nations is to support uh, countries to reach the goals that have, the very far-reaching goals that have been established under the convention. We support with technical assistance. Um, and we support key institutions that are involved in, uh, in the fight against corruption. So uh, with, uh, with, with regard to the judiciary, um, EACC, DPP's office and other offices, uh, again also with the witness protection, we've been working quite a bit with them yeah. in order to support their institutions to get stronger. And that's the mandate that the Kenyan government have, uh, has requested that UNODC gets involved in. Yeah. We also have uh, support programs when it comes to prevention in which we educate the youth. Most recently, we had what was called a hackathon yeah. in which the young people were told to come up with ideas of how we can use IT to, um, use the IT to find solutions around anti-corruption initiatives. We all know that part of the problem is the human hand, you know? And uh, I want to applaud uh, the DPP, um, uh, EACC, and also other uh, justice sector uh, institutions that are looking at e-solutions yeah. so that a file does not get lost. We're able to see where did the file start, where did it go? Most of the time when you see a file, a file represents a life. A file in the court represents somebody's life, somebody's family, and, and the community. But um, with the e-solutions that are coming up, not just within the justice sector, but also within uh, the communities. So we have very great innovations coming from young people saying, this is the way we can be able to curb that hand of corruption. Curb, you know, it's always that kitu kidogo, isn't it? Yeah. I'm on the road, I've, I, I have an offense, um, how do I get out of this? It's oh, as if there is an e-solution to something like that, it gets easier for the citizen to actually work through an e-solution. When it comes to procurement, e-solutions, yeah. digital solutions, and then we also have work around building a culture of integrity. Uh, I think, uh, as Twalib said, for, for, for the last 50 years of our independence, there's, uh, there's been an erosion of the culture in which we see ourselves as, as um, people of integrity. Yeah. And it's gotten worse and worse. Um, and because our young people have been told yeah. that if you are corrupt, it works. It works for you. You get quick money. What's the point of going to school, trying hard to get a job? You earn little money when your friends are actually doing very well by cutting corners. Yeah. However, if solutions are found around this, in which procurement processes, for example, are dealt with, and e-solutions are found, so that uh, if you are corrupt, again, we have people in the justice sector. Yeah. We have people like, uh, like uh, Twalib within ESCC, we have the DPP, we have the DCI, we have the judiciary, all getting together in a multi-agency organization yeah. uh, committee to say, let us make sure that we find a solution that we tell the Kenyans that there will be a price to be paid once you get involved in corrupt activities. Yeah. We can pass that message over to our adolescents, our high school students, we also pass it over to university students because they are just gearing to get into the, uh, into the system. Yeah. And we also pass it over to the young children, the okay. very young ones. All right. Yeah. Jolim, you've been a leader in this country for quite some time, and we're talking about multi-sectoral agencies and working together. What comes to your mind when the judiciary sentences DCI boss, Kinoti, four months in jail? 
You know, you're asking me a, a very difficult question because I'm not a lawyer by profession. I think uh, I am not, I am equally confused uh, because technically I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I believe there'll be a solution for, to that. The, both, both of them, the DCI is trying to go to court and uh, I really like the way he's doing it because he's approaching it through the legal approach. He's having his lawyers who are presenting him and the judiciary is also handling the case. So I think it would be too early for us to talk about it yeah. because technically that matter is in court. Yeah. And uh, you know normally there's that law which says that when something is in court you cannot discuss about it. Because I may say something here and then you're told did you hear the head of ESCC talked about this? So it's, it's something that is still in court. Yeah. Let us wait for the court process. Okay. Let us not comment on it. All right. Yes. Is that your position as well, DPP? Because you chair. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer. <coughs> yeah. Um, I think it's uh, it's sub uh, But but then, you know, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, the DCI, because he was recently elected in uh, in the Interpol, which. Uh, gives Kenya a lot of credibility. It's a very important uh, organization. And, and it should tell you the status that other countries globally yeah. hold us on. Um, so um, uh, I, I think we have our own challenges. Uh, <clears throat> but these are issues that uh, 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 can, can, can be uh, um, um, we will be overcome yeah. eventually. Yeah. The judiciary is an independent institution. Uh, DCI is also an independent institution. Uh, and uh, I think the best thing is uh, to leave it in court yeah. and get uh, the, best, uh, the, best, uh, the best out of it. Um, <clears throat> but you did ask me about the anti-corruption committee. Yes. And in the anti-corruption anti committee, uh, uh, that is under the NCAJ, um, headed by uh, the Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the ODPP was given the money to chair that, that committee of the NCAJ. Uh, and in it, we have ESCC, we have DCI, we have the judiciary itself, and we are sitting down to find solutions uh, in, 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 uh, in, in being able to um, <clears throat> fight corruption and, and, and recognizing that as much as we are independent, we are interdependent and, and, and that we have to work together for the benefit of Kenyans and ourselves as Kenyans. Um, so um, the purpose really of, of this is, 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 is to ensure that delays uh, are, are, not, uh, um, uh, are not the norm yeah. uh, and that um, uh, we are able to expedite them, yeah. but also give corruption um, cases the attention that they deserve. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Let's see what else you're saying here on online. Bring it up. Let's see. Brick George says, ask him why is in the DCI you know, not your convict, not stepping aside, not going to committee, is he above the law? That is a conversation they've said it's sub judice, they don't want to delve into that. Odongo Rolex says it is true they're leaning on a political divide when it comes to a matter of fighting corruption. We have seen politicians siding with deputy president claiming they are being targeted. We can talk about this issue of being targeted, actually, to Alib. Is there a certain time and a certain period where some politicians, and we've had this, claiming that they're being targeted because the elections are here? Or is it just the wheels of justice that keep flowing and sometimes it happens to come on an election period? You know, in fact, I'm very happy that I've seen that question. Yeah. Uh, when normally the politicians are bashing us, that we are, taking, we are, being, we are being used. Yeah. You know, as I sit in my house, I really get agitated. And I'm very happy that I'm in this forum. You know, I want to answer those politicians who keep on making noise that uh, they're being targeted. When they're stealing, they don't tell anybody that they're stealing. When they're caught, they say there's a problem, that we are targeting them. If you look at the governors that we have charged, of course, some of them keep on jumping from one party to another, but basically you have governors from all political divide. But politicians are very smart. They have, not, they have not done psychology, but they are very good in psychology. 
they know how to psych the public. A politician will know that he has been summoned by ESCC because Rudin has said here, we must be fair to everybody. So when we are summoning you, Trevor, today is second. We'll tell you, report to ESCC on 15th. We'll give you about two weeks. We, you are accused on this and that and that. We give you a letter. Then you work out. You have known, you have been summoned, and you know what you are being suspected of. So you start tweeting and saying this and that and that. You go for talk shows. You sequence the talk show in a very systematic way that the last talk show, tomorrow you're reporting to ESCC. And you say, what did I tell you? After I have done this and that and that, now they have summoned me to ESCC. But you don't tell the public they had summoned me two weeks ago. And from the public part of it, it makes sense that this politician is being targeted by ESCC. But there is something that politician is hiding. First of all, maybe we summon him first, or her. He or she has refused to honor the summon. We send what you call compelling order, that now if you don't report, we are coming to handcuff you. So you arrange your own propaganda of how you are, you are, you are being targeted. We will be very stupid as ESCC to charge somebody based on political pressure or machination knowing very well that when we charge you, you'll have your good lawyers, it will go to the DPP. By the time the DPP gives a, a go ahead, you'll go through a judicial process. And definitely, if these are politically targeted cases, it will collapse. Yeah. So there is nothing like that. Kenyans are just being duped by these politicians. They know what they have done for those that we are investigating. And we still treat them as suspect. So when it comes to, say, politically targeted, don't be fooled. They know there is something they have done. We don't chase wind. Before we follow a case in ESCC, we have sequences. Okay. The allegation or complaint will come to the report center, or we'll get through our intelligence, or people on the ground walk in. And they'll say, this particular MP, this particular governor, he, has, he or she has done A, B, C, D. We, don't, we, we just don't jump into a case. Yeah. We do what you call preliminary investigation. Is this a case worth to be followed or not? Because you may follow a case only to realize these are politicians trying to settle scores. Yeah. And you end up nowhere. You have wasted time. You have paid your investigators. You have used the uh, government money and there is nothing to, to, to charge, or there is no offense. Yeah. So by the time we write that letter in this type of a paper, creamish. Yeah. By the way, Trevor, there are a lot of conmen with uh, letterheads of ESCC, a lot. In fact, there are more conmen investigators on the ground than ESCC investigators, yeah. because sometimes people come, including senior politicians. Uh, what is it? Uh, I'm supposed to report to ESCC. There's this letter. Then uh, our people at the reception, they know our letter, say, Mushimiwa, he let an effect. And some even admit <coughs> yeah. that they were extorted. So we are talking of a genuine letter. And an ESCC letter will tell you there will be Trevor Ombija and Twalim Barak to, to welcome you at the headquarter. Normally, there will be two people yeah. to come and uh, record statement and whatever. By the time we take that procedure, we know we are almost certain Will find you, will find you with a corruption offence. Okay. So when these politicians are making noise, yeah. they know what they have done. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it's just a matter of, uh, and sometimes it works very well for them because they really get public sympathy. Eh? Yeah. And uh, we are actually, unfortunately, we when you look at the tweets and whatever, mm. you find that we are on the receiving end. Okay. Yeah. Let's bring up more of those tweets coming through to our studios here. Trevor Mbija, Citizen TV, Kenya is hashtag Daybreak. Mogire Jasper. Says the war on graft is rife because of the people hired to fight it. I hear them telling us how corrupt we are. To Najua, and that's why we hired you. Make it tough for us to like corruption. Hired, hired as a cook, the kitchen can't be hot for you. <laughs> Nuruddin, what is your response to that? Uh, <clears throat> fine, uh, but the owner of the kitchen can also make it a bit more airy. 
yeah. and ensure that we are able to cook and, and serve them appropriately. <laughs> so, ukipoa kicha ni metengezo na banda na niyo, si hata kuku atakufa tu hapo ndani, na moshi. Unatupatia makaa, moshi, ni banda imefugika hapo ndani, tutasafoketi. So, what we are saying, you know, give us also the good environment yeah. to allow us to work uh, and be able to deliver. Okay. Uh, because then if that, uh, that is done, because it's everybody's responsibility. Um, uh, corruption is a blunted abuse of power. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, and, 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 and power is given by the people. Yeah. So the people must make sure that the individuals that they, 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 they give and, and allow to do some of these things are people of you know, a certain caliber um, that you know will reduce that. Okay. But kama kila mtu, kila kitu umeleta, you know the whole thing is just there to just collapse. No matter what cook you take there, yeah. they will not be able to deliver. There was a question earlier on on the <clears throat> Pro Public Procurement Act. Are there sections of it that you think are self-defeating in the fight against graft? That, that's a good question, uh, Trevor. Because, for example, one of the problems that we have with the Kemsa case is the Public Procurement Act. And in that act, it provides that in cases of emergency, yeah, it gives a blanket, sort of like a blanket uh, uh, ability for the CEO or whoever is dealing with that emergency to be able to procure. And procure and then get retrospective approvals. You know? So when somebody does that, how do you then now go back and say, wait, wait, why did you do this? You'll tell, but it, is, it was an emergency. That's why we went and bought this PPE, CG for 9,000 what they came from China. So what happens? The ESCC and, and ODPP will have to go a step further, go all the way to China and see, are this, were this, at this time, were these things actually costing 9,000 shillings? Or were they costing 100 shillings or 1,000? For us to be able now to tell that person, OK, it was an emergency, fine, you were able to procure this, but these amounts were ridiculous because we have evidence from this company in China. We have evidence from this individual in China. Uh, then we'll be able to, you know, prosecute effectively. Yeah. Uh, so uh, um, that act itself has to be reviewed. Yeah. We must be uh, very certain on some of the clauses. Uh, for example, in the PPRA, the authority itself, it only gives opinions. You know, uh, and some of the opin opinions are non-binding. Uh, yeah. Maybe the authority should be given a little bit of, you know, powers to suspend, to do this, to do that, you know, uh, to be a little bit more, with a little bit more of teeth. Yeah. So, so that procurement is, is aligned. Then again, when you go to counties, the other problem that we've seen is that the procurement process is not aligned with the IFMIS process. Mm. So we asked in the earlier stages in 2018 and 2019, we asked Treasury to ensure that they are aligned, that you cannot do a, a procurement without aligning it to the payment processes, yeah. and that they are seamlessly connected uh, so that we can seal the loopholes uh, that are happening in the counties and, 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 and elsewhere. Um, so there is a bit of homework that has, be, has to be done, yeah. and it is being done slowly. Okay. Charity, how significant is the World International Anti-Corruption Day and looking for ahead into it on the 9th of December? What do you wish is achieved? So this is a day that has been set aside by the world in general. You know, a day to acknowledge the problem, the, the, the depth and the length of the problem that faces not just Kenya, but the world in, in particular. If you heard about the, the COVID-19, um, uh, corruption cases, it was world over. It was not limited to Kenya. Um, and so this is a day that has been set aside for government officials to take stock of where they have come, looking at the convention that looks at prevention measures. But then also it's a time for citizens to understand. It's really a time for them to understand I, uh, that my no counts. Um, my individual action counts. It might be a small action, but it counts towards the bigger picture. I want to quote Wangari Madai, who talked about the, um, the hummingbird. 
the little bit of water that you pour. Yeah. It is important. And, uh, and this is the day that we say um, the no of the public citizen, the rights holder counts, the no of the, of the people that we have put in office yeah. to support us counts, and that they do need us to support them. We don't put them in a position and then set them up to fail by not coming forward with evidence, by not, not supporting them, and then, uh, and then saying that this thing is not working. We really have to come together. It's a time for us as, as Kenyans to come together and say, this is a corporate and a societal responsibility. Yeah. Where have we failed? How can we do better? Where can we as a society tell ourselves that it's not a blame game, it's a game that requires all of us to move forward. Yeah. Trevor, I think I've given you an example uh, some time back of the cost of corruption on the road. And I, I gave that at a different forum where people, uh, the police say that it's just a 50 wop. I, I want to go about my business, you know? You're going to stop my business, I give you 50 bob, we go on. Yeah. But what is the cost of that 50 bob? And I, give, I go back to the Westgate, um, to the Westgate um, uh, tragedy that yeah. happened to us. Those people who passed through the borders, passed through so many police, police checks, 50 bob, that is the prize. That is the prize of a terror attack on us in Westgate. It's the prize of people's lives, people's wives, people's husbands, people's children. The prize is so high. Yeah. But we do need to appreciate that prize to understand that my no and my action, my 50 bob, is not just a 50 bob. It is an enabling, uh, an enabling uh, uh, action towards the wheels yeah. of corruption. All right. Yeah. Let's see more of your feedback coming through here and see. Let's bring them up as we finish up really quick. Uh, let's see that, that we had read that already. Asamo Food says so. DPP Haji is asking Kenyans to stop voting for corrupt leaders. Why is DPP and ESC Kenya clearing those with integrity issues and asking Kenyans to stop voting for them? You fail in your mandate and blame voters. This is something both of you can talk about. Can, is I, that take, can I take yes. that one? Yes. First of all, I I need to tell the public, we don't clear. We give a feedback to IBC. And uh, we'll say, these are the issues of the following. Yeah. This man called Trevor Ombija is having the allegation of this and that and that. There's a case before court. This one, we have record here, there's a complaint on this and that. Yeah. We are still investigating. This one, we have a he has been charged. The case is before court. Yeah. But now, within the Constitution, and uh, the DPP has talked about it, the Constitution is very clear. You will only bar somebody from uh, holding a public office if that person, whatever is accused of, he has, he has pursued all the legal framework to its conclusion that, uh, and found guilty. Yeah. I'll give you a good uh, example. We have politicians who we have charged in court for possessing fake academic documents. Yeah. I don't want to mention names. They are serving. The term is almost coming to an end. The case is still in court. Some of them you've been reading, uh, Trevor. Yeah. Those guys, after finishing the term, the first five years, if they vie, they apply to vie for the next term, both IBC, ESCC, nobody can stop them because there are matters they have not been concluded. Yeah. So today, if you are illiterate, completely illiterate, and you go to River Road and get a fake Form 4 certificate or a degree, then you apply and we say this degree is fake. You get a lawyer and say, take me to court. You are not stopped from vying. So these are some of the gaps yeah. that are really bringing down some of these efforts to get clean people vying for public position. Mm -hmm. And I would like to tell the public, there's something very important that we need to know. Yeah. There are no laws to safeguard integrity. There are no laws. You cannot put laws to safeguard integrity. Yeah. Integrity is, is an inner conscious that somebody has it. 
either you have integrity or you don't have integrity. Yeah. So you cannot have a law to say this is the barometer of measuring integrity. But who is the best person to observe that you don't have integrity? Yeah. Is member of the public. So we still come back to you and say, even though the law is weak, there are gaps, and we know. And the, the, we, we have been fighting to have laws amended, like yeah. but you are told no. If you do this way, mm. you'll create a window for people to be victimized, not to vie for political seats. So it is not an issue to deal with D, uh, ODPP. It's not an issue to deal with uh, ESCC. It is not an issue. Like the last election, we flagged 118 people yeah. to the IBC that these people, we feel they have issues here and we feel they should not be cleared. The IBC, we don't, I don't blame the IBC. The IBC said legally, if we don't clear these people, they'll take us to court and they'll win. So we don't, want, we, don't, we don't need to waste money. Let us clear them. And you see quite a number of them who have been holding either governors and whatever, yeah. Now they have fallen uh, with issues to deal with integrity. They've been charged before court. But still, as long as their cases are still in court, even if tomorrow they are found guilty by uh, uh, the, magistrate, uh, the lower court or the high court, and they put an appeal, they can still vie for the political seat. Yeah. Some of them now, even those who have ch been charged in court, some of them now are in active campaign. Either they want to become MP, or they want to become uh, governors. Yeah. And when we watch news from Citizen and other media channels, you can see they are very serious contestants. Yeah. The reason, they have the political support from grassroots, irrespective of their records. Okay. DPP, is there a bit of friction between yourselves and the DCI? And should uh, KRA, for example, have prosecutorial powers? Because when it comes to tax issues, there seem to be a bit of a challenge there back in the day when Humphrey Karaoke was taken to court and you lost that case. Well, we did not lose that case. What, what do you mean we lost it? It's in court. Yeah. Now, Trevor, tell me, if I start asking KRA to allow us to collect taxes, will they agree? Maybe not. Yeah, why should they ask for prosecution powers? Why is it that everybody under the sun wants to be given prosecution powers? Except me. <laughs> except, except, e <laughs> except ESCC. Yeah. Why? You know, yeah. that's the question people should ask. Yeah. Uh, 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 if they want, let us share, then each person's mandate. Yeah. Uh, then ODPP will have a department for collecting taxes. From lawyers, maybe, they can give us that work. <laughs> uh, you, you know, um, uh, we, 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 we need to look at things critically and be serious. Uh, the state powers to prosecute lies with the, with the ODPP. Uh, the powers to delegate prosecution powers lies with the DPP. The DPP and the ODPP has set standards that are required before individuals can, uh, can, can appear as prosecutors. That's why we have established the Prosecution Training Institute and all prosecutors will, are now required to go through a one-year rigorous training before they can go to court and, and pre present the Republic of Kenya, which is you and, uh, and uh, Mwanainchi. Yeah. Uh, because we cannot keep on, as government, uh, uh, going for individuals who do not have the skills, and then we expect, you expect us to deliver. So the government has invested, it's investing in the PTI, so that you have the quality and the right caliber of prosecutors in court, uh, to challenge those defense lawyers that uh, ESCC CEO was saying who, 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 are, who, are, who are very good. We want to be able to have prosecutors who can. And, and that standard will have to be met by each and every individual that wants to seek those prosecution powers. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Trevor, uh, you know, so, sometimes let's ask those people and put them in, 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 in the right place. I have no issue with the DCI at all. Uh, some of these things have been of, or, 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 uh, you know, uh, uh, overplayed by individuals who I think, and I believe who are cartels, uh, 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 who, who want to thrive uh, by ensuring that uh, they, they build this perception that uh, ODPP and, and, and DCI and even ESCC when you started, you were asking <laughs> Twalib if, if there's friction between us and there's nothing like that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, th these are things that 
Kenyans should not be hoodwinked. Okay. As ODPP, we are working towards uh, collaborating and cooperating. We have our own uh, motto of retooling, recasting, and, uh, and, and, and uh, um, relearning yeah. that, that we are doing. And in it, it has encompassed all these things that I'm telling you. That, uh, and, and, and what even the CJ is trying to talk about social transformation. And social transformation, uh, which is the CJ's clarion call now, uh, is something that will encompass all of us, institutions, Kenyans, yeah. everybody, to change. And, 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 and ensure that uh, we, we, we own this country yeah. uh, and, and, and we, we, we are doing our, our, our part uh, that, that is required. ODPP, for example, uh, and I think ESCC has clarified, it is not our duty to uh, vet people. We don't vet. Yeah. Um, what I know constitutionally is if an individual is convicted, then they cannot run for office. Uh, the other one, we will highlight, we will charge people, they will be taken to court. It's up to the Kenyan to decide whether they want to charge that person or not, because constitutionally, unless we convict them, they can still run. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let me see some of your feedback before we take closing remarks on this now. Vet Mutai says, I'm surprised the ACC and DBP are admitting that we have cartels stealing, yet they're responsible for salvaging our country. I think they've addressed that. Agumba Steve, Kenya is making big strides in fighting corruption, but the bottleneck is the individual differences among the key players and political interference. Independence is one thing. They've addressed that too. Fim Wangi says the war on graft should be focused on strengthening and restoring integrity to our institutions. As long as they are weak, corruption will still roam large. Okay? Joy Masharia says, I think they will be won when all of those fighting against it will work together, but mostly the judiciary because it's the one which drags us behind with the backlog of some of these cases. Okay, Isaiah says, my blame goes straight to our constitution, which aids and defends graft lords through court bonds and cash bills. Okay, Kipkoech Kelvin says, we want to see leaders step aside whenever mentioned in corruption cases. The message will sink in every citizen and fighting this animal called corruption will be easy. All right, Tualib, for you, what is your greatest achievement if somebody was to ask you as the ESCC and then also as we look forward to the World Anti-Corruption Day, what is that event looking like? What is the new rallying call? I, I think, uh, let me go to the activities first. Yeah. We, we highlight this uh, day normally a week before yeah. and part of this forum today here is part, uh, part, forms part of the activities that will culminate to the official launching of the day that is on 9th. We chose two counties, that is Mombasa and uh, Isiolo. I hope I won't be asked what was the criteria. Is, uh, are they the <laughs> most corrupt or are they the cleanest? But uh, we just looked at the geographical location. Yeah. We said let us get one county in, Mo in coast and one county in uh, deep in northern Kenya. And uh, we, have, we are carrying a, uh, a number of activities like what we do, we call corruption risk assessment to certain institutions, including these counties. And uh, we look at the fight against corruption, not only the issue of taking people to court, but also preventive mechanism. And we are also doing training and the sensitization of the community. We'll do some, uh, there'll be some radio presentation. We'll have uh, uh, what you call open barazas. Yeah. Like uh, on uh, 9th, after the governor in Mombasa launches the, the, the uh, official, uh, does the official launching, we will march all the way to Mamangina uh, Garden, uh, that is Mamangina Drive, and we'll be able even to have the media. We have also planned on 8th uh, December, there will be a sort of an interaction uh, live talk show uh, where the DPP and myself will be there, ready to take more questions, and uh, also to conduct what you call outreach program using caravans. Yeah. So th those are the activities that we have. We have also, we have also partnership with the European Union, and the UNODC or on this, and that's why you can see uh, one of our very close ally here, Charity, she's around. Yeah. Uh, they really help us, especially funding on technical capacity. And now the issue of uh, milestone. Yeah. You know there are three types of milestone the, the commission uh, gets. Some are not visible. You know, Kenyans want to see people being locked on Friday and then taken to court on Monday, and out of that they believe you're working. What we have done is that uh, 
as at now, in the last financial year, we have finished 163 uh, high impact cases which have been concluded yeah. and uh, taken to the Director of Public Prosecution. And uh, cases that have been finalized in court, there are about 87 cases on corruption, economic crime, and unethical conduct. Trevor, people need to know, we don't just talk about taking people to court. We also do uh, handle issues of unethical conduct. Maybe somebody, as a, a head of state corporation, has been employed without following the due process. Yeah. We write to them that they have to nullify and re-advertise that post. So when they do that, normally it doesn't get media attention, but it really helps to avoid internal hidden impunity yeah. within government public service. We also have done a lot in uh, asset recovery. We have recovered uh, assets that is mainly land worth about 14 billion shillings yeah. and filed 14 applications for preservation of such assets with an estimated value of 9.4 billion. We have a lot of prime plots in um, Nairobi, Mombasa, and other cities which were illegally allocated do during those days uh, when uh, grabbing was being glorified. Yeah. And we have filed quite a number of cases before court. All these uh, pieces of land, we have valuers in uh, ESCC, and the value that, the right current value is about 9.4 billion. Yeah. By the time this is recovered, it will, uh, maybe the value will be more although it takes long, and a yeah. good example of this is the Woodley houses. Those ones were recovered about one year ago, yeah. but the case took about 11 years, uh, Trevor. So those are some of the challenges. Yeah. And we also have a number of asset recovery cases, approximately 685 cases pending in various courts, and we are seeking to recover assets worth 11.4 billion. Okay. We do disruption. Yeah. Everywhere in a government organization you may get a plan being uh, built or being mooted, yeah. a plan that on, is on the way to defraud a county, to defraud central government. And we have Kenyans. We are not condemning citizens. Yeah. They are good citizens. Many of them are good. And they walk and say, there is this and that and that. This plan or this project is just meant to siphon government money. And yeah. we, we go there and disrupt. And out of that, we have managed to save about 10 billion shillings. Okay. And then we do all what we call corruption risk assessment. Right now, we are doing it in uh, nine places. We, we completed nine of them. Yeah. And uh, maybe I can highlight what is corruption risk assessment. I'll give you a good example of the NYS. I keep on talking about it. When NYS1 took place, the scandal, we did a corruption risk assessment. And part of the finding is that we said NYS should be an autonomous organization. Yeah. But because there were people who were benefiting out of that, they disregarded the, our recommendation. And that is part of the weaknesses of the law. Some of these recommendations that we put are not binding. We have no powers if people don't follow what we have recommended to take action against them. So we are trying to move and talk to Justice and Legal Affairs Committee in yeah. Parliament that some of the laws on uh, ethical conduct the ESCC should be given power to, to do what you call enforcement. Okay. And another milestone which I would like to talk about is we have really, the ESCC, yeah. through its act, it's it is allowed to partner with any partners who can assist in the fight of corruption. Today we are very proud. We are so much uh, in partnership with the UN uh, ODC, with the European Union, uh, with some... Um, international organization, yeah. and also the DPP has said, we are also partnering with infant anti-corruption bodies, trying to make them work. We are in partnership with the anti-corruption body of Congo. Yeah. We have done a lot of uh, exchange with the anti-corruption commission of Tanzania. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in partnership with the FBI. We are in partnership with the Serious Fraud Office. We are even planning to have some officers from ESCC to be seconded yeah. to the Serious Fraud Office in UK as part of the learning process and empowering our organization yeah. so that they are able to deal with corruption, especially when it crosses a call, uh, beyond, the beyond the Kenyan jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah. All right. DBB, closing remarks for you. What would you like to see going forward into the World Anti-Corruption Day or any commitments you're making? us as Kenyans, yeah. uh, and, and in which nobody is, is above the law, um, no matter how, how powerful that individual is. Yeah. 
Um, and and uh, through this uh, and corruption day, we also want to assure Kenyans uh, that we will, you know, prosecute and recover the monies which would have been used otherwise to build schools, you know, hospitals, roads, and, and etc. Um, and that our priority moving forward, and we've been trying to work on this to build capacity, yeah. is to ensure that we are able to recover assets and proceeds for Kenyans. Uh, so that the, the monies then are invested for the benefit of Kenyans in the right in the right areas, we will therefore endeavour to make um, corruption uh, unattractive, uh, and, and and that 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 is what uh, we we want to commit ourselves to, um, uh, Trevor. I think in terms of. Um, you know, uh, the CEO has talked a lot about uh, the gains that they have made. Uh, some of us are usually reserved, yeah. <laughs> but but as as ODPP, we have uh, continuously for the last three years maintained a 90% conviction rate, uh, which which we are proud proud of, and that can be uh, interrogated uh, if individuals want. Um, the introduction of the decision to charge is something that a lot of Kenyans don't seem to understand that it is momentous that we are able to tell investigators, uh, not only on corruption cases, but on human rights, uh, ca cases that involve human rights abuses, cases that uh, involve uh, uh, miscarriage of justice, yeah. that the decision to charge has given the prosecutors uh, the ability to say, this file is not ready and we are not going to rush to court to charge. Uh, that, uh, that, that individual, that Kenyan, uh, has a right uh, uh, to ensure that before prosecutors uh, make that decision to charge, there is evidence. Mm. Uh, I know there's been a lot of resistance, but this is for the benefit of Kenyans. Um, uh, I think we have also managed to revitalize ODPP. Yeah. We have now cre been able to create a team, uh, a team that is ODPP, that is working seamlessly and tirelessly to ensure that Kenyans enjoy yeah. Uh, 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 the services that they're supposed to enjoy, that it is a servant leadership. Uh, we've been able to come up with um, uh, uh, um, our excellence charter that outlines what we intend to achieve yeah. and that Kenyans are then able to take us to task if, 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 if we don't. Uh, we have established the, the PTI. We have a number of outreach programs. And all this, we're also being assisted by UNODC. I'm happy that uh, the representative here from the UNODC is a Kenyan. Yeah. And therefore she understands the problems and she has uh, uh, um, uh, the love of this country and has really been able to assist us uh, from a very Kenyan perspective and understanding what some of the challenges are. Sometimes when you have individuals who are, who are not Kenyans, um, they don't know what challenges we are facing. Uh, and, and some of that assistance that comes in, uh, as much as they are um, in good faith, um, uh, they don't tend to uh, be geared towards getting our own local solutions to the problems that we have. I also want to take this opportunity to yeah. thank the European Union um, that has worked with the UNODC. In fact, they are the biggest donors yeah. uh, to the justice uh, uh, sector, uh, and they've really focused on uh, giving us uh, support in fighting corruption. Um, so, uh, you know, this um, um, activities that we'll do will be geared towards uh, recognizing the efforts that various individuals have done to ensure that Kenya is able to meet its, its, its objectives and, uh, and, and um, obligations in, in, in the war against corruption. All right. Charity, closing remarks. So, um, <clears throat> So one thing I must say is uh, the, the privilege of working uh, in this sector and, and supporting the justice sector to, to reach their goals. Uh, and it's not just the goals of the justice sector, it's the SDG goals that, uh, that are linked, uh, very interlinked with everything that has to do with corruption. When it comes to the SDG goals on access to water, access to education, access to healthcare, 
all these things are impacted when the money that's supposed to go to those institutions is taken away and taken to places it's not supposed to be. So um, as, as UNODC and, and, and with support from various donors and especially with, through the EU, we've been working very closely with the, with the justice sector to make sure that, that, the, that, that there is a seamless delivery of justice. Um, it's not about a blame game. The issue that has to do with um, cases lasting in court is across the board. It's not just the corruption cases, it's all the other cases. Yeah. And it has to be addressed um, uh, comprehensively. Uh, the CJ has been very much on board with this, yeah. uh, as well as all the other justice actors being very much on board on really making e impact yeah. on what matters most to Kenyans. Right. We think that um, that aid is important. The amount of money that is leaving this country yeah. in the form of money laundering and assets that leave this country is huge. It is time that Kenyans reclaimed their, uh, their, their assets. They reclaimed their future. Yeah. They said it is up to us now to make this work. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for making time this morning. To Ali Barak, ESCC CEO, Nurdin Haji, Director of Public Prosecutions, Charity Kagwe, Head of Criminal Justice and Anti-Corruption at the UNODC. And thank you for all the feedback. We're taking a quick break now. When we come back, it's time for What Breakfast Tips with Willis Bazu Raburu. See you in a bit.